before you found Jesus. <laughs> I, did. I went around the world a couple times, if you know what I'm saying. If my kids are here, plug your ears. Sometimes you have to search it out. Sometimes you get, you get all over the place and then you come back, amen? This song's called Graves Into Gardens because I was dead when I wasn't following Jesus Christ. Was I, was, I wasn't living for him. And then my garden bloomed. And I'm a landscaper, so that's really cool. I love flowers and trees. I'm a psycho. I wake up at night thinking about plants. That's okay. That's okay. So sing this with us. This is our last song, the worship song. And it's just a really fun song. I search the world. But it couldn't fail me A man's empty phrase and treasures that fade I never know Then you came along Better than you, Lord. 
Absolutely nothing better than who Jesus Christ is uh, in our walk with him. There's nothing better. Um, as we get ready to receive our morning offering, I'm going to ask us to pray. Uh, I am going to lift up Carl uh, and his, uh, his bride just passed away just a few days ago. Uh, you may not know him, but I know him just as of this morning uh, and took a lot of courage to come when his heart is grieving. Um, and so I just want to pray for the whole family. Father, we just come before you today grateful for all that you do for us. And you know the grief and the ache of the heart when someone is lost to us. And we just ask that you cover that whole family up with your grace, your mercy, and your power, and your peace, God. And today as we uh, get ready to receive our offering, Father, I pray that you would uh, uh, just be blessed by our giving back to you, a portion of what you provide, and that we do it not out of force, but out of cheerfulness. And that, God, we give back a portion of what you provide. And, Father, hold us accountable as a church family to what you give to us to do good works within these walls but far beyond it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 <clears throat> as that's going around, I'm also going to have um, uh, some, uh, a couple of deacons and uh, some of the greeters that we're meeting with you. And in a moment, I'm going to have uh, some things distributed to you. Um, but before we do that, um, each, I don't know how many Sundays or Easter Sundays I've had with this. Um, but wait till we get start diamond. Wait just a second. Just a second. Sorry. Sorry. Um, what, um, I have a, a brother that often brings me, um, treats on Easter Sunday. Okay. And I don't know who invented peeps. <clears throat> I'd like to talk to him about what they're thinking about nutrition wise. Although I eat Twinkies by the dozens. Um, but, but this year I have just not a box, but I've got a sucker of peeps. Uh, and my brother Eric is always really good about providing these for me. Uh, I have them stored and carefully put away. Um, and then a chocolate cross. So he's always good to me. Always good to me. 
Um, okay, so um, right now, as the offering has kind of gone out there, we're going to have uh, some distribution of gifts to you. Go ahead and come on up, Mike. Um, and these gifts are, are in this little bag like this. Now, those of you who I've taught in class, I know there's a few of you out there. This is not good teaching practices. I'm going to give you something before we start the lesson. Okay, it's not a it's not a good strategy. I can tell you how many uh, student teachers I correct and say, don't give that out and let, if you want their attention. Okay, but this is what I ask you: when you get this, I want you to do your best. You can glance at it if you want to, but do not open it. This is the cookie jar. Don't eat a cookie. Okay, I'm just going to ask you to hold on to it. You can put it on the ground beside you, whatever. But please don't get into this yet. Okay. Um, the chairs are set up with electronic shocks, and it will sense whether you're getting into them or not. Uh, but basically, don't get into this. Later on in the service, we're going to talk about this gift from Granite Lake Community Church to church members and those of you who are guests today. Okay? So as those go around, just hang on to them. Don't open them up yet. Okay? <laughs> How many of you hunted for Easter eggs this morning? Oh, only a few. Only a few of you. Make sure you find all... I warn everybody, I don't know. I've been doing the pastoring gig for, I don't know, a long time. And I would tell everybody, make sure you find every egg if they're hard-boiled eggs, okay? When I was a little guy growing up in Fort Hall, mom and dad hid the eggs. I got up and I thought I found all of them. They thought I found all of them until about three weeks later. And it was not good. We were under the house looking for corpses. We were looking for some animal who had crawled under there and died. It was that bad. We finally narrowed it down and found it in a little old picture uh, that we had in the living room. So please, make sure you find all of them. Um, again, this is an, an, uh, the day that is significant for all of us as believers. Um, it is a day, it's the, the, the focal point of our faith. It is the aspect that, that we know, without a shadow of a doubt, that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen. Amen. Jesus took up residence in those of us who have asked Christ into our heart as Savior, as King, and as Lord. Uh, and he's, through the power of the Holy Spirit, he's alive in us. The, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about God the Son today, along with God the Father and, the, and God the Holy Spirit. But today is is so critically important and such a celebration. We take a moment to think about the suffering, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But we take a larger moment to talk about the gift of an empty tomb, the gift of a God who loved you and I and every person who has ever walked this planet from any part of the world, that he loved us so much that he went to the cross willingly to die for you and I because he knew that the end game was the beginning, and that is an empty tomb for us. And so today what we're going to talk about is this aspect of God's passion for his people, for those he created, those he uh, uh, knitted together in the womb and knitted into that fabric of that very person that is you were, as we're going to talk about later on, were works, were things for you to see and you to be a part of that that act of love when Jesus draining from all of his blood, all of his blood leaving him still willingly went to the cross. The strength, the passion, the compassion, and the love that it took to crawl up on that cross for Bill Hain. Worthless, sinful, and he went to the cross. He looked all the way into 2024 and said, Bill, you need this. You need this in your life. Don't miss it. And that's the message of Easter's. Don't miss it. We're going to have fun today. You're going to, uh, you're going to enjoy yourselves. Uh, after this, you're going to go out to po probably some dinners and stuff or whatever. Um, some of you might be watching March Madness. Oh, it's a bad thing if you're a Gonzaga fan today. Although some of you Cougar fans might be celebrating a little bit too with that. Um, but <laughs> um, the event of the crucifixion and then the resurrection changed all of history for this entire world. It took away every sin of the world when we give our life to Christ. And that's always the question. Do you believe 
or do you not believe? Do you believe? And then if you say, yeah, I believe, do you believe enough to allow him to change who you are for the better? Most of us have the essence of who we are throughout our entire life. But God comes in and wants to do a remodel, wants to come in and take up uh, residence to be able to change, to become more and more like that little image that he formed in the youngsters, like that little critter you're holding, Ruby. And so we're called today to just contemplate what it is that took place. Jesus, because of his love for you, endured torture, endured a mocking, being spit on, being beaten to death, having skin ripped off of his body in sheets, in strips. But he did that because he loved you. Then they put him into what they thought was an impenetrable, uh, impenetrable tr uh, tomb, a place that could not be opened to allow the body to escape. But when they put him into that tomb, they thought it was over. <laughs> that was just the beginning. God brought him back to life. And here's what I do know, and that is that when Jesus was put into the tomb, he was still busy. Those of you who have done studies know that Jesus took that time to go into Sheol, to release those who believed in Christ and who had passed on, to release them. And the others who did not believe went to that other place that if you believe in hell and God, you know that there's a Satan and a hell. But he released them, and he forgave all of our sins. And because Jesus said, I have business to do, I have work to do, the tomb is empty. He fulfilled scriptures. And for millions of us, this is that day that we take to remember. We do it every Sunday here. Okay, Every Sunday. It's not just one Sunday out of the year. Every Sunday we gather together in churches everywhere that proclaim Christ as Savior, to talk about who Jesus is and our life in him and how we respond to his call on our life. It is important that we continue to talk about this aspect of our life uh, and, and how it plays itself out, what we allow ourselves to do. Mike or, or Brian may have said something along the lines of, of wandering this world. And I, don't, I wasn't looking, but I heard that. Uh, how many of you have wandered this world looking after only yourself? You don't have to raise your hand because every one of us should probably raise your hand. I was chief and am chief of that kind of stuff. I wandered this planet for a long, long time without a relationship with Christ. However, I knew someone, met someone, and I, those of you who have gone to church here know that that person is Jennifer Hain. And Jennifer and I met at LCSC, and she became my touchstone. And I told you the story, and I'm going to tell it very quickly. And that is that I, I saw and fell in love with Jennifer because of her eyes as she walked across campus. And um, I asked her out on a date, and we went out on a date. And I'm, we're 20 some years of age, and we went out, and she says, You want to come back to my house? And I'm playing baseball, I'm a college student, young man. Yeah. Absolutely, I'd like to come to your house. Um, and so we go over to her house, and um, we're there, and, and uh, she gets out some, some pops and, and uh, tea, and then she does this. Never heard it before, never heard it after. She, after she brought out the pops and stuff, she came, you want to read the Bible? <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're honest with yourself, you fellas, ah. Uh, that's not what I was thinking about, um, but okay. And we read the Bible and I didn't grab it yet, but that was my touchstone. The person that said, this is so important to me that I want you to know it. This is so important to me that I don't care what you think of me. I don't care if you get up and you walk out. I want you to know that this is important to me because I love Jesus is what she said. Jesus Christ is at the very heart of our faith. He is our faith, the foundation and the carrier of all that we go through, all that we do in our life. I'm going to read out of Colossians chapter 2, just a summation of things related to our, our faith in God, our faith in a God who uh, was willing to come to this planet in, in body form, in human form, to, to teach and to live and to suffer and die and be buried and then 
to raise again. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And when you and I were dead, when you and I were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, the lust of the flesh, the following of me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity, so to speak, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out, canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He has taken out every debt of Bill Hain and every future debt of us. And he put it out of the way. And it put, he put it on himself, every stripe, every nail, every whipping, every scourging, every aspect of his death were seen as my sin. And he took it for me and put it out of the way. I believe it wholeheartedly. It took me a while to come to that. It took me a touchstone named Jennifer to call every now and then. I was telling Jennifer the other day, we were watching a ball game. I said, hey, what, 45 years ago, I was in uh, uh, Mississippi, a place called Percy Quinn State Park, doing hacky sack stuff, okay? <clears throat> and they had a, a payphone. How many of you remember payphones? Remember a payphone? Some of you were like, what? I pay for it every month, so what are you talking about, right? <laughs> ching, ching, you dial it up and you get a dial tone. Well, I called Jennifer on Easter Sunday and she talked to me and her voice was a reassurance that the belief that she had was real. And it continued to speak to me until just after we were married, about three years into our marriage, I gave my life to Christ and was baptized. And that's the belief. Before that, I was raised in church, okay? I grew up in this country. I was free. I, like I said, I, I thought I was a Christian. I'm not. Just because we grew up in a church, just because we were born in this country, just because we live here doesn't mean anything until we make a decision to say, Jesus, I accept you into my life because I'm a sinner. And it's in that moment that he begins to change us. Begins to change us. To make us not new and improved, but in completely new. Completely new. This passage captures what it is that God does for us. Very quickly, I want to just say this, and that is that the world, before I kind of jump into what happened this past week in Jesus' life, that this world says this, you must first see it before you believe it. You've got to see it first before you can believe it. At the very heart and at the core of us as believers is that first we must believe and it's only then that we can truly see. It's only then that we can truly see the incredible love that God has for us and trust it and know it and believe in it that he wanted to bring us hope through Christ. Healing, forgiveness of every sin. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say I haven't sinned since that moment I gave my life to Christ because that would be an absolute monster lie what it has assured me of is this and it doesn't mean that i can sin at willy-nilly it means that i will fall short you will fall short after you give your life to christ and you will sin you'll stumble you'll fall because we're made out of this stuff flesh we'll struggle with stuff but the grace that keeps on loving upon us is that which we can turn back to and say god i am sorry and really really mean it how many of you that uh, have been forced to, you remember this when you were younger, forced to say I'm sorry to your mom or your dad, or forced to say I'm sorry to your younger brother or younger sister, that brat, and then you look at him and go, I'm sorry, and that's about it. No, mom said that, get back over here. Mean it this time. Mean it this time. I'm sorry, and then move on. When we say truly that I'm sorry and repent, we turn away from that and turn back to Christ. Forgiveness is there. That is the grace that comes in a relationship with Christ. That incredible, powerful grace that cleanses us. Last week, we talked about the Passover. Very quickly, I'm going to talk about what happened this week. I'm going to rush. Jennifer, raise your hand if you think I'm rushing way too much. Okay? But I'm going to try to get through this. Then I'm going to read some passages out of Matthew and John. Um, Passover, or uh, um, um, Palm Sunday. We talked about this last week. 
it, was, it happened on the heels of the raising of Lazarus, which is when the, the uh, Pharisees and everybody really amped, ramped up their efforts to squelch, quiet, and kill Christ. Okay? Jesus departed from, La from that place where Lazarus was raised from the dead. That was his last miracle till the resurrection, but that was his last miracle. Jesus goes away for a period of time for about 12, 15 miles away, a place called Ephraim, a wooded area, non, uh, no, no gardens, no, no vineyards, everything there. And he's there with his disciples. I think, in my mind, he's gearing up for what he knows is coming. The disciples have no clue. They've heard everything. They've heard preparation talks, teaches from Christ. Still, they're not ready, as we'll see. Yet he comes in, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace. Coming in, uh, throngs and multitudes of people ye yelling, Hosanna in the highest. They're praising him. Those same groups of people, that multitude of people in a few days will be yelling, crucify him. Yet Jesus still loved him enough to go to the cross. Wouldn't be long until after that Palm Sunday entrance that Jesus would enter into the tomb and see all the money changers had turned, entered the tomb, entered the temple and saw all the money changers who had turned the, the house of worship into a financial aspect. And he overturned all the tables. Things that were getting in the way of the message of who Christ is, he overturned it all. God will overturn tables in your life when you think that you have it made. He'll overturn tables to say, will you look at me first and always through whatever you're going through? So he overturns those tables. They still didn't get it. Jesus' authority is challenged. All that week, Jesus debates with the religious leaders and Jesus continues to teach about his impending death to the disciples and that he'll be gone. He confronts and denounces the scribes and Pharisees. If you know this, you know that the scribes and Pharisees, the high priests, are all the religious leaders of Israel at that time. And Jesus, who always saved his particular anger, righteous anger, for those religious people because they weren't in a relationship with Christ. That's the difference. He, over, he, he, he confronts them and calls them whitewashed tombs. They look powerful and incredibly awesome on the outside, yet inside they are a decaying corpse. He says that they are occupied by the bones of the dead, looking good on the outside, which is what their goal was, and maybe not even close to who God wants them to be on the inside. Calls them unclean, and that really ramps up their intensity to say, how dare you call us that? And they want to kill him. They want to get after him. And then in the middle of this, Jesus wants to minister to those who are closest to him, the 12 who are following him, the disciples. And they go and they re re uh, uh, hide away to a spot, and they have the Last Supper, where Jesus gives us another example of what you and I are called to. Jesus has the Last Supper with all of his disciples, all 12 of them, even the one who was an enemy, the one who would betray him, Judas. He still sat and had fellowship with him. Then what did he do? He took it a step further for us as believers to understand what we're called to, and that is to serve and love others well. He took off his garments down to his waist, and he washed the disciples' feet. Stinky, smelly feet. He even washed Judas's feet. He even served and loved on Judas, knowing that Judas is going to be the one that turns him in for money. Why? Because our God is an incredibly loving God. And he wants us to understand that. He goes to Garden of Gethsemane after that. And um, in that area, he goes off to pray, asks his disciples to pray with him, stay awake and alert. They fall asleep. Jesus wakes them up twice. You can't even stay awake for an hour or two. And he prays and prays to the point where he sweats blood from his head that's the kind of intensity that he was praying with because he knows what's coming and as the arrest takes place the soldiers come in the roman guards come into the garden and they begin to arrest him and it's peter who i'm going to talk about a couple times today peter who jumps into the foray grabs a sword from somebody and wants to chop off somebody's head 
Instead, he swings, misses everything except Malchus's ear and cuts off his ear. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Wait, no, this is not what we're about. You still don't get it. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Lo those who live about the world will die about the world and miss who he is to love and serve others well. Peter goes on to have the infamous denial of Jesus three times. The third one being when he swears, he cusses about not knowing Jesus. Shh. During the trial, which is a sham, they move them back and forth between Herod and Pilate and all that kind of stuff. And in each place, they continue to whip. They continue to tear his flesh off. They continue to spit on him and mock on him. All of the things that he knew was coming. And finally, they get him to carry his own cross up to Golgotha. And at that point, he comes, uh, he's put on that cross, nailed, with spikes that are probably this long and about that big around. Okay, one here, one here, and one between, on, through both feet, between two thieves. There's no more gruesome death than a crucifixion. Jesus at times, and though, even though it's probably thieves, but Jesus particularly, because of the cramps, remember he'd been drained of almost every part of his body's fluid. There were times in which he could not take hanging like this and would suffer the pain of trying to stand up on his feet who were, had a spike drilled right through him to relieve the pressure for just a moment. He did that because he loves you. He did that because he knew in three days he would finish his work. He would continue to do things in our lives and in the lifeblood of a church. And finally on the cross, just before he says it is finished, there are two thieves. One of them's they're both mocking him at first. One of them continues to mock and mock and holler at him. If you're really the Messiah, why don't you get yourself down from here? Just teasing and mocking the heck out of Jesus. And these two thieves are like all of us in history. Until I gave my life to Christ, I was that thief who was mocking. I wasn't really making fun of anybody, but I was not following Christ. It was the other one who made the decision. I don't know if it was an eye contact with Christ while that thief was hanging on the cross, but something happened to him that stopped him from mocking and denying who Jesus was. And he, he told the other guy, you need to shut up. We're getting what we deserve. I'm a sinner is basically what he's saying. I get what I deserve. This man has done nothing. And he looks at Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me today in your kingdom. He knew something was different about Christ and he wanted it. He knew he needed it. Jesus said, just like he said to me when I gave my life to Christ, he said, today you will be with me in paradise. And the thief is. Then they took him down, and this is where we're going to pick up with, with Scripture. I want you to turn to Matthew 27. They took him down, and it was Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who was a disciple of Christ, a follower. He provided, and what's interesting is we're going to read about in, uh, what did I say, Matthew 27? Is that Joseph of Arimathea didn't go to the scribes and Pharisees, didn't go to Caiaphas, didn't go to Herod, didn't go to anybody else in the religious leadership to say, can I have the body of Jesus? <laughs> he went to Pilate. He didn't have any respect for those who were trying to get rid of Jesus, those who had succeeded in putting him on the cross. So he went to Pilate and asked if he could have the body, and Pilate said, absolutely, take the body. And Joseph of Arimathea put him in the tomb that was meant for him, put Jesus into the tomb, okay? Okay. And I'm going to read right before 62, uh, verse 60. And they laid his body in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock. And he rolled a large stone entrance against the entrance of the tomb and went away. That stone, they say, is anywhere between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds heavy. Remember that for when the tomb or when the stone is moved. And it was also, as it was pushed over in front of the tomb, it slid into a kind of a canal, a channel that locked it in place, okay? Two grand, 2,000 pounds, and locked in place. 62. Now the next day, which was the one, which is the one after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember 
that he was still that when he was still alive that deceiver meaning Jesus said after three days I am going to rise again these guys even understood it the disciples might not have still understood it because they run away fearful scared amazed at what had just happened because their savior their lord and teacher was gone these guys understood maybe something that was going on Therefore, give orders to the grave, for the grave to be made secure until the third day, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first, meaning what Jesus said came true. The body still never was found. You understand that? The body of Jesus Christ was never found. It was resurrected, and it lives inside of you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Pilate said to them, verse 65, <clears throat> You have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and they made the grave secure. And along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. There were both Roman guards and the guards of the religious order that were guarding the tomb. Some say between 20 and 40, people, 40 men, 40 soldiers. Did they want Jesus to get out? Absolutely not. This tells us that. They don't want him to get out. They know that it will lead to a greater movement. He was being followed by multitudes. What would happen if his body disappears? I'm here to tell you that we're part of that. Millions and millions and millions of people because of the love of Christ are part of that. Now after the Sabbath, verse 28. After the Sabbath has begun to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And, he, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his garment was white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Here was the most powerful army at that time, Roman guards, armed to the hilt with weapons, and they were afraid. Afraid of the person that they just beat up, saw die, and put into a tomb. And they shook with fear. They laid down and pretended to be dead, scared. Of what? They had been guarding the tomb all night. They'd been taking care of it, making sure. So I'm going to turn over to um, verse 11. What happens in between there is that Jesus, there's some appearances and discussion between Jesus and those who were there. The last one, verse 10 says, then Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go and take the word. He's not talking to the, to the guards here. He's talking to those who came to minister to him. Take the word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there she, they shall see me. Now when they were on their way, behold, some of the guard came into the city. And they woke up. Okay? They must have awakened. And reported to the chief priests all that had happened. And when they had assembled, and remember, they went to the chief priests, not to Pilate, because they knew what would happen. What would have happened to those guards had they come back and said, hey, his body's gone. They'd have been dead in a heartbeat. They'd have been imprisoned. They'd have been dead. One of those two. They told him what had happened. And when they had assembled the elders and counseled together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, all of them. And said, you are to say this, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And he took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. If a soldier, a Roman soldier, even some of those of the religious court had fallen asleep on duty, into the jail they would go. Or it's more severe punishment. Yet they were more willing to endure that than face Jesus, than face an empty tomb. They, they said, hey, I, I think we'll go ahead and do this. So they told a story that this group of unarmed disciples, unarmed disciples, not trained in the military weapons and way, ways. They were fishermen and carpenters and tax collectors. Yet they're the ones who came in while they were asleep, 40 of them or so and rolled a 2,000 pound stone out of the way and took Jesus' body. Something they did not want to have happen. The resurrection. Remember, most of the disciples had scattered. They left. They wanted nothing to do with this. So I'm going to ask you to turn to John chapter 20 this time. Turn back. 
we're going to go to or turn forward. We're going to turn to Matt or Mark, uh, John chapter 20. Okay, we're going to read a little bit about what happened. Okay, we've got we've got soldiers who were guarding, pretended to be asleep, scared to death, reported it for money, and then got money as a result of that to tell a lie. Okay, and in John chapter 20, we're going to read something else. Verse one, the empty tomb. Okay. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, which you kind of read in that last one, came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. And so she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where he, they have laid him. Peter, therefore, Peter's always the first one to get up and go after it. Even if it's a mistake, he jumps up and says, i got to get busy. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. <laughs> and here's a human moment, this next verse, a human moment in John. And the two were running together, and the other disciple, who Jesus loved, <laughs> ran ahead faster than Peter. <laughs> Did he have to put that in here? Uh, Bill Hain, hey, I want to make sure that I ran faster than Jesse today, and I'm going to put that in this passage. Okay? I got up and I ran. I passed up Jesse on the way to the tomb. You got to know that. <laughs> I think God's got such a great sense of humor. And the other disciple ran faster ahead of Peter and came to the tomb first and stooping in and looked in and saw that the linen wrappings lying there. But he did not go in. He gives Peter credit here. Simon Peter, therefore, also came following him and entered the tomb. And he beheld the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. I want to say something about that. In that culture at that time, every young boy who waited and served a master would wait on the sidelines and wait for the dinner to be done, for the master to be done eating. And they would not clear out any of that food and all the plates until the master did this. Once the master did this and threw his, his linen or his towel onto the plate, wadded up, that was a symbol that I'm done. That was a symbol that I'm done. That gave them permission now to go in and, and clean up. What did, that, what did that passage just say? They saw the linen that had covered his face rolled up and placed carefully apart from the other wrappings. When a, when a master who was done, who was um, maybe not done eating, they would roll up or fold up their, their linen, their napkin, signifying, I'm not done yet. That's what Peter saw. Peter looked in and he saw all the linens and the blood-stained linens there. Then he looked over and here was the face cloth carefully wrapped up, rolled up, folded, placed there apart from the other linens, saying to those disciples, I'm not done. It is not finished yet. When Jesus died on the cross, he said what? Right as he was dying, it is finished. What was finished? The dying for you and I, my sin, death, it was finished. Here he is saying one more thing, I'm not done. I have more work to do. And over the course of the next several days and weeks, Jesus appeared to hundreds of people. Jesus' work is not finished yet because there are more and more people on this planet now and who are coming who need Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um... Those presents that I gave you. How many of you have peeked yet at those gifts? Taylor, your mom raised her hand too. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Today is about the gift of Jesus Christ to us. And so the gift that we as at Granite Lake Community Church want to give to you is this. It is still not, he's still not done. Remember that. So I want you to go ahead and take a look at this. Okay, I'm going to talk about what this is, okay? Don't open it all the way up yet, but just take a look at it. Hold on to it. Those of you who have been students of mine, tell me when I'm not teaching real well uh, here, okay? Um, what I want to tell you this as we get ready to open this up, there's a passage in Scripture in Matthew in which the disciples are talking to Jesus, 
And Jesus asks them, who do the people say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Well, some of them think that you're John the Baptist come back. Some of them think that you're Elijah. Others say that you're Jeremiah. And then he gets more specific and he looks right at Peter or he looks at the disciples just like he's looking at you today. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And, and, and Peter's the first one to bark it out. He says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus has this comment back to him. He said, you said right. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Of, of, uh, the walls are not penetrable by the walls of hell, the, 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 the uh, onset of, of hell. He said, you have said right. That upon this church, I will, upon this rock, I will build my church. Some people think, and, and a religion, particular religion, is based upon the fact that Peter is the rock. St. Peter's Basilica is there where that, that body was laid. Okay? I believe that Jesus is talking about upon him, this rock. He is the rock of our salvation. And he said to all the disciples, and he says to you and I, upon this rock, the truth of Jesus Christ, raising from the dead, it is not finished yet. I still got loving to do through all of you to win more and more people to the kingdom of God. It is not finished yet. And upon this rock, Jesus Christ, I will build my church. And I'm going to talk about that in relationship to this. So if you want to, go ahead and open this up. What you're going to find in here... You're going to find a pen, a pad, and I'm going to talk about each of these. First, I'm going to talk about the two attributes that relate to God, okay? First one is this lifesaver. Jesus is our lifesaver, okay? Jesus is the lifesaver in our life, all right? Um, John 3, 16, for God so loved what? The entire world. Please understand this, not just America which sometimes is communicated by lots of preachers, that it's just us. Some, it, it, it doesn't say, for God so loved a particular political party. For God so loved the world. Last week I said this, God even loves Hamas. And they came against his chosen people. He went to the cross for anybody in that group that would believe in him. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would be saved, would be saved from death. Then there's this, this little nice little nugget. Rolos. You know, I almost grabbed those cool-looking kisses that are wrapped in gold, but they have nuts in them. Then I remember there are people who have allergies to nuts. Anybody have any allergies to chocolate? Uh, we're safe then. There's caramel inside this baby too, okay? This baby represents Romans 5, and 5, 6 through 8. You see at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, but God demonstrates the deliciousness. Ah, sorry, had to go there. The sweetness of his love for us by going to the cross, dying for you and for I for me. God demonstrates his own love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A lifesaver, a sweet, loving thing that was compassion, passion, and love for you and anybody who walks this planet. Brian, if you guys want to come on up here in a little bit, go ahead and come on up now if you want to. The other two things, you've got a uh, a small, empty page, little journal. And you've got a pen, okay? I want you to, with this pen, go ahead and open up to that first page. I want you to write your name. Write your name. And when you do that, I want you to write down if you have a favorite verse or John 3.16. And as you're doing that, I'm going to read what fits the pen. This is out of Psalm 45, 1. It says, my heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition concerning my king. 
My tongue, my life, is the pen of a ready writer. Your life is this. In front of you, in, from this moment forward, will you touch others for Christ? Will you accept the call that says, who do you say that I am? When you accept Christ as Savior, are you really willing to be changed, to be made more and more like him? Because God wants to build his church on the rock that is him with your shoulders. If you don't have a church, I encourage you to find one and plant and grow deep roots so that you can minister to others, that you can be part of the building of his kingdom, what we're all called to. Now, I'm, I'm like a lot of folks. When I first, gave, when I first came to Christ, I uh, fought with Jennifer about going to church every Sunday. I don't really want to go. There's a football game on. I don't want to go. Come on, man. That guy talks forever. I don't really want to go. I have this, that, and the other thing to do. I had all kinds of reasons not to go until I fell deeply in love with who Jesus Christ is. And then I look forward to coming. I look forward to seeing you all that we, that we have fellowship with every Sunday here. Those of you who have blessed me and others by being here today because you're traveling or because you said, hey, I, let's go today. My prayer and my hope for you is to be changed. That's my prayer for me is to be changed and made more and more like him each and every day. But that you would see the value of who you are in a church, in fellowship. The notepad says this. It's a series of blank pages ready to be filled up. This is from the moment of Easter forward. Now, there's not that many pages left in this but your life has days or years or decades ahead of it how will you write out god's kingdom work in your life that's what easter is about we wake up on easter and jesus is asking the question who do you say that i am will you join me as we build my kingdom will you share the shoulders with others and believers in christ to build his kingdom hook into a church doesn't matter to me whether you're here, whether you plant yourself or not here is not my concern. Jesus will take care of that. What I will pray for, and you should pray for, is to find a church that preaches the good news of Jesus Christ and Christ alone. I've told my elders and my deacons and all of you at different times on Sunday, when I start to go away from this, you better rip me out of place. This is not what we're here for. But find a place where you can worship. This says in uh, Psalm 139. And I think about that little guy right there. Charles. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me. When as yet there were none of them. When as yet, he's only, how, how old is he? So he's about 30 days old. He's got days and days and days ahead of him, like you and I do. Jesus and our, our creator God knit together in a womb, us, and put days ahead of us to say, write your story. Include me. Include me. I got to tell you that I have been one of those that has missed many opportunities to step into what he has had planned for me when he wove me together in my mama's womb. And as I grew up and played all kinds of stupid things, did all kinds of stupid things, followed my flesh, didn't want to get involved in church, I missed so many opportunities and things that were written on my life because of Christ. But since that time, I've been writing like crazy. And I've been writing with fellow authors every Sunday for Christ. Who do you say that I am, he asks. So as we get ready to close up, we've got a song left for you. But I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, who do you say that I am? Jesus, who went to the cross willingly for us, for you, for me, to take every sin from you and every future sin in your life waits for you to say, you're the the Messiah. You're my Savior. You're the Son of the living God. He waits for you to say, I accept you into my life. And if you're a believer, 
He's asking you, what else can we do together? What else can we take on that is part of my building of the kingdom upon his truth, his rock? With heads bowed and eyes closed, Father God, we come before you grateful for all the things that you are to us and today to us. And as we celebrate your resurrection today, God, your incredible, compassionate love for us, your kindness, your mercy, and that just unfathomable hope that you give to us in an empty tomb because you love us so much. I thank you for my wife. I thank you for my kids and my grandkids. I thank you for this church family and the fellowship that we have, the richness of that love and interaction. And I thank you for the honor that I don't deserve to be a pastor, to be a preacher, to be up here in front, but that you give me your willing spirit to endure. I thank you for every person here today and their families. And I ask God that you bless them. Father, with heads bowed and eyes closed, as Jesus asks you, who do you say that I am? If you have not ever accepted Christ as Savior, you, maybe you think you did, but you're not sure. If you haven't and you're not sure and you want to do that today, you want to say, Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I want you to not to me, but to God, raise your hand to say, God, I give you my life. I accept you as my Savior. I am a sinner. Nobody else is going to see. I see your hand. I don't. I see your hand and your hand, your hand. Jesus sees your hands. Amen. I see your hand. I see your hand. Even if you've